All right, so I had this really, really awesome metaphor planned. <laughs> and uh, about lunchtime today, I was thinking about it, and I don't know, just something didn't quite add up. It didn't really fit. And Brene Brown is kind of like, I don't know, all of our saviors a little bit. I feel like when Rain and I talked, we all of a sudden we started talking about Brene Brown, and we were like, yeah, Brene Brown, she's amazing. And so I was thinking about Brene Brown, and she talks about vulnerability and how vulnerability is what breeds connection. That's how we connect with each other, by being vulnerable. And I realized the story that I had planned was not my most authentic, vulnerable story. And so I had to kind of sit my ass down and really think about, okay, do I feel like I can do this? Do I feel like I can tell this story? I've never openly told this story ever. Can I do this? So, so I did. So excuse me if it's a little choppy. All right, I'll do my best here. So burnout. My story is going to be about burnout. And it seems to be a theme, um, something, and I'm a burnout researcher, so let's put that out there to you. Um, and the funny thing about burnout is that um, we know when we have it, even if we can't express what it is, even if we can't name it, we can feel it. It's this uh, invisible weight, this fog that sits around us. We can't see it, but we know it's there. And so my story is about the burnout researcher that burnt out. The irony is there. And I first like to talk about burnout. Like, what does it feel like? Well, it kind of reminds me of exactly what it says, burnt out. You burn. You are ashes of your former self. You look at yourself in the mirror, and you have no idea who you are anymore. And that's something that I know all too well. And I like to think about the process of burnout it's funny, these cup metaphors, it's interesting listening to the other speakers and being one who gets to go later because I'm like, man, there's some similarities in kind of like how we think about things. And when I used to teach my students, I used to say, you know, think about burnout like you're holding a cup, and a lot of us are right now. So when you're holding that cup, imagine that cup is full of marbles. And every time you respond to a stressor in your life, you have to take one of those marbles out. Right? And stressors can be good and bad, and that's something we don't think about a lot. So there can be good stressors, there can be bad stressors. Either way, it's taking resources away from you and giving it to something else. And that's okay, that's life. Like, that's part of living. But the problem is, is that if all we do is keep taking the marbles out and we're not putting any back in, that cup isn't magical. That's not like Harry Potter's suitcase, right? That thing doesn't have an infinite amount of space. It has a bottom. And if you keep giving and giving and giving and giving and not putting anything back in, it's going to be empty. And then you're really in trouble. And I'll tell you what, you know, I, uh, you know, I got my PhD in 2016, and I was in my doctoral program for four years. And a doctoral program, as I'm sure is very similar to an MD, it will test you in ways that you never expected. It'll test your resilience, your persistence, your ability to juggle and be everything all at once. And that's above and beyond everything that it tests you as, as an academic of your skills, what you've learned, what you know. It tests the very essence of who you are. And as a result, a lot of people in doctoral programs they suffer from burnout. It's very common. Um, and, you know, for some people, they're engaging in what I call recovery activities, things that put those marbles back in your cup, and they're doing it without even realizing it. They'll be in this activity. They'll be maybe hanging out with friends. Maybe they're a runner and they go running. Maybe they like to um, donate their time at the preschool at their church whatever that is, but all of a sudden they go and they engage in this activity, and then all of a sudden afterwards when they leave, they feel just a little bit lighter than when they went in. That's what recovery feels like. You feel just a little bit lighter after you engage in that activity. For me, those activities were, during my doctorate program, were 
having fun with my friends. I was a huge runner. I ran my first marathon several years ago. My mom, who's sitting here, was there at the finish line. Um, proud mom. And um, during my doctoral program, in addition to handling all of the stress and the demands and the emotional and mental physical demands of a PhD program, I was also in a physically and emotionally abusive relationship. So I was with a man for three years who berated me, who beat me, who treated me terribly. And I had to find my way back to myself. And it's funny because, you know, I remember looking back, I'm thinking, man, you know, how do you let yourself get to that place? It happens slowly, just like burnout. It happens slowly over time until all of a sudden you wake up and you're there. And you're in that place and it's so hard to come back from that. And so I was there in the third year of my PhD, you know, I had just, um, I had defended my dissertation. I was, the finish line, you know, it was there. I could see it. But I couldn't function. I was feeling emotionally exhausted. I was depersonalized. I felt like there was no place in this world for me. Even though I knew I was going to graduate with honors. I had a 4.0. I was doing everything that from the outside looked like I had my shit together. But behind closed doors, it wasn't the case. But no one would ever know. Kind of like this idea of how secrets breed these issues. And I kept it, and I kept it a secret for a long time. Until one day, I had an experience where um, he hit me, and it left a visible mark to where I couldn't hide it from the world. And so that was the moment. It was, okay, you can't hide this anymore. You literally can't. It's on your face. You can't, you can't hide it. There's no amount of makeup in the world that's going to hide that. So I said, you know, this is the moment. You have to choose a different path. You're not going to be able to make it without this. And the hard part was is that I had, you know, my PhD burnout situation. You know, I had that. But through the abuse, the abusive relationship that I was in, I had isolated myself from my friends and my family. I had isolated myself from the things that used to bring me joy, the things that helped me recover from that persistent burnout, because those demands, they weren't going anywhere. It didn't matter what was going on in your life otherwise, so you have to find a way to cope. Find those things that bring you joy in your life so that you're capable of responding to all of that stress that you have to deal with. So it was like, I had to hit this rock bottom. I had to have this moment that was the wake-up call. The experience that said, okay, this is it. And so, little by little, I started making changes. I left that relationship. I started seeking out my friendships again. And of course, you know, one of my best friends, Lindsay, you know, she, she knew about all this that was going on. And she tried her best to be there for me. And I can't imagine how difficult it was for her to watch me go through that. But when I came to her and I said, hey, you know, I've done this, I've left, this is what I've done, she was right there waiting for me, waiting to support me, to lift me up, to help me through that. And what was beautiful about all of this is that everyone was like that. Every single person that I came to after being away for a little while, welcomed me back with open arms. And so that process of recovering from that and recovering from that burnout and finding my sources of recovery again became a little bit easier and a little bit easier and it was painful. It was like running through mud. 
You know, it was slow and painful. And eventually, the more I kept pressing and the hard, no matter how hard it was, the more I kept running through it, eventually the sun came out, the mud dried, and I shaked it off. And I was able to sprint and I ran as far as I could away from that person that I had become. And I, you know, I started running again. I ran my second marathon the last semester of my PhD. I started volunteering. I, I loved visual art. I painted for a really long time. And so I started volunteering at the hospital, doing bedside visual art for patients in the cancer center um, that I did my research at. And that was amazing. And I felt like I was connecting and giving back to people in a way that I can't even describe to you how rewarding is. <laughs> and uh, I, little by little, realized that I was going to be OK. For a long time, still after that, you know, and this is 2016, and now we're in 2019. And I left that relationship in 2015, spent that, that last year of my PhD just really kind of going through this transformation. And I kind of look at that as the hardest time in my life, the most defining moment of my life, was that choice of choosing myself, of being selfish. Because a lot of people think that by choosing yourself, by self-care, by investing in yourself, by putting yourself first, is selfish, and it's not. Because the, uh, there's this quote that I love that's, you know, I'm going to better myself for you, right? And that's what I did. I bettered myself for everyone else. And it took me a little while. I looked back on that, that time a lot, and from then and, and where I am now from then and how much I've changed and grown and my perspective has changed. And for a long time, I used to look at that time in my life with this kind of guilt and shame that, you know, God, Nicole, what was going through your head? Like, how could you even deal with that? What got you to that place? How, you know, why did you waste all of that time? And I started looking at that as wasted time. And I recently, in the last year or so, have reformulated kind of how I look at that. And I, I say that, you know, I kind of look at that as my time of rebirth, that um, I burned out. I was a phoenix. I burned out. I burned. And then I was reborn from my burnout. So thank you. <laughs>